News Centre Now at this hour begins in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, where President Bola Tinubu has sworn in Justice Kudirat Kekere Eku as the 23rd Chief Justice of Nigeria, pending her confirmation by the Senate. Kekere Eku took the oath of office and swore assigned the oath register at 11.40 a.m. local time at the council chamber of the State House of Abuja on Friday. She succeeds Ariwola, who assumed office on June 27, 2022, and bowed out on Thursday upon attaining the mandatory retirement age of 70 years. Justice Kegere Eku is the second Nigerian female jurist to serve as the Chief Justice of Nigeria, after Justice Aluma Maria Mukhtar, who was the Chief Justice of Nigeria from July 2012 and November 2014. And still on judiciary, in a historic development, Justice Kudirat Monto Muri uh, Olato Kumbo Kekereoku has become Nigeria's second female ju chief justice. She was born on May 7, 1958, in Lagos, and Justice Kekereoku embarked on a distinguished le legal uh, career, beginning as a state counsel in Lagos before advancing to the High Court. Her judicial career saw a significant adv advancement in 2020, or rather 2004 when she was elevated to the Court of Appeal, one of the highest appellate courts in Nigeria. Appointed as a Justice of the Supreme Court on June, on June 8th of 2013, Joseph Kikere Eku has been praised for impactful contributions to Nigeria's legal system, participating in key decisions that have shaped the, na the nation's uh, jurist uh, pedigrees. Now, she is now the second female justice to attain the position of Chief Justice of Nigeria. Earlier, a senior advocate of Nigeria, Adeyinka Olumide Basiku, spoke to us on this development. Take a look. Uh, the sex so the occupants of the position really matters. It will be matter for advocates of, um, you know, maybe if feminine is advocates, I don't know, but I mean, she's uh, the justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. She's risen through the uh, ladder of uh, the judiciary right from the magistrate's court. So she knows all the problems. Uh, she has experienced it. She's participated in it. She knows what the problems is at the magistrate court level, the high court level, the court of appeal level. And she's been on the Supreme Court bench for quite some time. So she also knows uh, what areas uh, you know, to address. So I think that um, um, her rise to that position is significant because she doesn't need to be told, told anything about the problem with the Nigerian judiciary. For more discussion on this historical development, we're joined by a legal practitioner, Towo Oseruwo Ja. He joins us from the United Kingdom. Well, Towo, many thanks for joining us. Uh, and let me just start by, you know, very yeah. historical appointment uh, for uh, Justice Kekere Ikeri, uh, Ikeri. Eku's uh, appointment, which is historic, by the way, Nigeria's second chief, uh, second female chief justice, uh, and shaping her leadership and influence in the judiciary reform efforts. What are, what is your take on her appointment and our appointment, and what do you think her contribution will be for the judiciary uh, reforms that we want to see for the country? Well, on my take is uh, a fulfillment of the provision of the constitution, which uh, the need not to be a vacuum. Uh, in any gap at all in the Supreme Court, but which is the happiest court in our land, like people would normally say that uh, whatever the decision of the Supreme Court is, is one of the decisions that you cannot only you cannot only accept, but you must also agree with it. Well, a way forward, if you look at it somehow, you could see that um, uh, I can recall that some of his decisions, some of the panels she led, they are really last sliding decisions, and she's bold and courageous when she's making or uh, expressing the uh, legal wisdom, which is known for. And I believe that uh, some of the reform, like uh, if you look at what the president um, is, uh, uh, the immediate past CGN said uh, during his dinner, you discover that most of the reform they crave for is not issue of policy, but issue of law. Except the constitution is amended, there cannot be proper reform that can be, uh, uh, that can be expected of uh, my, my lord. And mm. secondly, I will also say that um, apart from those critical areas my, my Lord points out, the only area we should be looking at my Lord's, uh, uh, my Lord's uh, uh, intervention is the issue of 
the alleged corruption or uh, misconduct of judicial officers, which by virtue of his position as the acting chief justice of Nigeria, he heads the national judicial uh, he heads the national uh, national judicial uh, council, and this council is responsible for disciplining uh, discipline of uh, L judges. So we expect to hear uh, more of uh, them looking at the excesses of uh, judicial officers in all cadets of uh, in all the hierarchy of the courts. Um, one of the conversations that's been had about reforms when it comes to the judicial system or our judicial process entirely is the modernization of court procedures and, and rules that are crucial for the Nigerian judiciary. What actions should, you know, Justice Keke Reiku prioritize to ensure that these reforms are successfully implemented? Okay, the, the, the first thing he needs to do is, first of all, see how he can identify stakeholders. Uh, uh, like I said, most of the reform, so, most so, of the reform they are talking about are so, not reform within the confines of the judiciary. So, These reforms within so, the law, the so, constitution. Yeah. So you keep miss uh, your, your pronouns. You keep saying he, that's a she. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, no, normally in our palace, when you say he or she, uh, you know, we said, okay, there are ladies in skirts. But for the purpose of this, now, let me use the word she. Well, one of the things she needs to, but oftentimes, if you notice my lord, they prefer to be called he, my lord, my lord, not my lady. So, they, please, if I use them interchangeably, I think it's correct in our legal uh, palace. So, like, most of the reform people are craving for is not something my lord can do on his own sitting in the bench. You see, the court, you see, is a court made up of the Constitution. And whatever thing the Constitution says about the court, that is what the court acts upon. Whatever procedures they put in place is in line with the Constitution. So most of the reform they are craving for, my Lord can only achieve more on if he can meet with the stakeholders and see that some of the areas of the Constitution need to be amended. If you notice, if you notice it, during the COVID-19, there was an issue as to hearing proceedings if, uh, virtually, if not for the uh, amendment of the Constitution, because it went as far going to the alteration of the uh, practice direction and all those stuff. Yeah, that is for that. But there are sensitive areas which has become a clog in the will of justice that can only be amended, that can only give the reform if the Constitution is amended. A good example, if you look at cases coming from the lower court down to the Supreme Court, which embodied the Supreme Court. You see, that is not issue my Lord or she can address on his own. This is issue of constitution that boils down to fair hearing, that boils down to the procedures of hierarchy as to court. Is that for the constitution to itemize issues that ought to exceed the high court down to the court of appeal, from the court of appeal to the Supreme Court? So you see, it's beyond my Lord's power, but rather my Lord can meet with the stakeholders and also parley with the stakeholders to see that this reform cut across board. It's political, it, 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 it has political solution, because political solution, it needs to, it needs to meet with the other heads of government, other um, arms of government. Right. And you also need the political will or the judicial will for such things to be implemented when the political will is an uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, assurance has been gotten. Speaking of judicial will and political will, one of the things that uh, is very, uh, you know, that has been spoken about oftentimes, whether it's the general populace or even, you know, at the judicial uh, pol pol uh, public affairs analysts, is about accountability and transparency with the judiciary and a conversation about whether or not the judiciary is being state captured. How do you see the, the new justice of Nigeria uh, being able to ensure transparency and accountability within the judiciary and they can have autonomy you know so that it's not state captured how do you think that the justice or her uh, her lordship is able to do this during this time with her new appointment okay the autonomy has been granted to federal high court i i, I can recall that during the time of uh, 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 president muhammad Bari, the autonomy, uh, autonomy has been granted to uh, all federal high courts including the supreme court the Court of Appeal and um, the Federal High Court, the High Court of the Fed, uh, Federal Capital Territory, autonomy has been granted to them. Just like, like I said, it not boils down to the judicial will. Then let me create one. Let me correct one impression. Oftentimes, 
Most of these cases that goes to public criticism and public domain for debate, sometimes people who criticize or who discuss these cases of transparency and accountability, they don't have the privilege of looking at the processes. Because just like I told, the judiciary is like garbage in, garbage out. They are blind to the society. That is one. Then two, we should also look at there is a justice who raised a complaint, a retired justice of the Supreme Court, who raised a complaint that outside the justices we see that sit at the masquerade, there are people who place the drums for them. How do we look at the employment cadre outside the justices, the employment cadre of non-judicial officers? How do we checkmate them? These are people who belong to several, uh, several groups. Like I can recall that most of the registrars of the court, some of them are legal practitioners that belongs to the Nigerian Bar Association, which has the privileges of petitioning them or asking any disciplinary committee to look into their conduct or reporting them to the judicial, uh, National Judicial Council. So the best thing my Lord can, my Lord can do is one, make sure that is to make sure that the transparency of processes because when judgment are given let people have public let people have the access to the record filed by lawyers because some of them are caused by professional negligence and the court has no no, no, no way not, nothing else to do than to what goes on the other side of the law that is one then two any hairy judicial officers should be sanctioned appropriately we could see how some of the judicial officers have thrown what we call the what we call the the, prof the professional decorum or the judicial decorum into the into the into the law. So in such circumstances, it's not only coming to the media. Petition them. You, I think um, they, they have about twenty three judicial officers who are undergoing undergoing investigation, and right. those investigation and the outcome of the investigation should be made public. But right. be that as it may, the society has a role to play. Lawyers have to, has a role to play, and him who has who has taken this responsibility in this crit, uh, critical time when the when the when the uh, when the trust of the masses of the judiciary is doing all right has a lot to play. All and right, it needs to start from its own ranking, which is who are those that have questionable character in the judicial service. Well, they uh, need to be pushed out. I mean. From your submission, there is very clear that it's a, it's a wrong road uh, to reform, and also uh, there's a part of uh, education, re-education that has to happen with the popul uh, populace as well. By populace, I mean the citizenry. But hey, Toro, many thanks for doing this with us. We appreciate you for coming on. Yeah, Toro Seru Waja, he is a legal practitioner joining us live from the United Kingdom, and he gave us his uh, his take on the historical appointment of Nigeria's second female uh, chief justice, and that is Justice Kekere Eku. Kekere Eku. Now, a bit of breaking news for you. The Supreme Court has affirmed the re-election of Minister or Mr. Odoye uh, uh, Diri as the duly elected governor of Bayelsa State after dismissing the appeal of Timi Priye Silva, candidate of the APC, in the November 11. 2023 off-cycle election. A five-member panel of the Apex Court, headed by Justice Lawal Garba, affirmed uh, of the Court of Appeal decision of July 15th, which deemed Minister uh, S uh, Silva's uh, appeal as an abuse of court uh, process for filing two notices of appeal. We'll bring you more details uh, as the story unfolds, but just a bit more uh, for those just joining us. This is breaking news at this time uh, uh, regarding the Biosa governorship torso as the Supreme Court has affirms uh, Duoye's Diri as Bielsa governor. And that's uh, for some breaking news for you for there. It's still unfolding. I will bring you more on that. We'll go for a short break. Stay with us. Now away from judicial matters. Vice President Kashim Shatima has charged the Nigerian armed forces to remain vigilant and proactive in addressing regional security threats. He gave the charge at the graduation ceremony of Course 32 of the Nigerian Defense College, Abuja. Shatima, who represented President Tunubu, said the current administration is determined to make Nigeria safe for investment and economic prosperity. He emphasized the need for strategic leadership to address the mirage of security challenges in the country. A total of 111 participants took part in the course with 19 foreign participants. 
And we'll come now back more to security matters much later in the course of this bulletin. But let's also tell you that six men arrested during the 2020 hashtag end uh, SARS protests have been freed after nearly four years in custody. The Lagos State Magistrate Court in Ogba, under the authority of Magistrate Bolanle Oshusomi, discharged the men on Thursday after they pleaded guilty to an amended charge brought by the Lagos State Government. The defendants, Daniel Joyobi, Ade, Adigun Sodik, Kainde Shola, so, so, Salauddin Kamilu, uh, as well as Sadiq Useni and Aziz Ishiaka, was accused of engaging in conduct likely to breach the peace, a violation of Section 168D of the Criminal Law of Lagos State 2015. Before their release, Mag Magistrate Oshusomi issued a stern warning urging the men to lead law-abiding lives moving forward and highlighting the serious consequences of their actions. Reactions have continued to trail the immediate suspension of Christius uh, Dawan, who was the uh, Commissioner for Budget and Economic Planning, and Jamila Tukur, who served as a Commissioner for Tourism, Culture and Hospitality in Plateau State. The suspension, approved by Governor Caleb Mufwang, also affected Dio Lamu, who was a special advisor on rural development, and Moses Sule, who served as liaison's officer for Mikang uh, constituency. New Central's Chizoba Anyowe tells us more. This is the first shakeup in the administration of Governor Caleb Mufwang since assuming office in May 2023. One of his promises to the people of Plateau State was to ensure that public office holders under his watch remain accountable and productive, otherwise be shown the way out. One may not be wrong to say that the governor's words have started playing out. The Commissioner for Information in the state was handy for more explanation to this unexpected development. There is nothing wrong with what has happened. It is reshufflement in governance and in government from time to time. You have to do that. And I'm happy that in this country, my governor is the first to suspend commissioners, is the first to reshuffle. We cannot wait until the day after forever before we do all of that. By this suspension and reshufflement, Plato people should know that we have a governor that understands the governance. It means he has reevaluated what is happening on the plateau. He has reassessed what is happening on the plateau. He has re-examined what is happening on the plateau. Later same day, the governor further approved a minor reshuffle of his cabinet, which Giang Berry, his director of press and public affairs, said was to enhance effective service delivery to citizens of the state. Under the new dispensation, Mr. Noah Nkup, the former commissioner for water resources and energy, will now serve as the commissioner for youth and sports development, while Bashir Dati, who previously held the position of Commissioner for Youth and Sports Development, has been reassigned as the Commissioner for Water Resources and Energy. There is nothing um, new, there is nothing strange in governance, these things happen. And I'm happy that Plato people have understood that the Governor um, is um, up and doing. The governor knows what is happening on the plateau. The governor has his ears to the ground and his... Um, the other aspect is that if the governor shifts you from one ministry to another, you have the right to say, I don't want, and you go home. If the governor suspends you, you equally have the right to say, okay, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to continue. So for me, I don't think there's any major issue of worry there is administration, administration, government, uh, and the governor doing what he or she needs to, to do from time to time. Meanwhile, Mr. Stephen Gadong has been appointed as the acting head of civil service of the state following the retirement of Mrs. Rauta Dakok, who reached the mandatory retirement age of 60 years on August 24, 2024. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba Anyui. Nigeria's worsening economic seems, economy seems to be biting harder on small and medium enterprises, especially petty traders who form the backbone of the local economies. 
It is against this backdrop that the First Lady of Nigeria, Oluremi uh, Tinubu, initiated a Renewed Hope Initiative, an economic empowerment program for petty traders across Nigeria. New Central's correspondent, Austin Azu, who monitored the flag of exercise in Delta State, brings us details. Nigeria's First Lady, Oluremi Tinubu, arrived Delta State through the Asaba International Airport to officially flag off the Renewed Hope Initiative an economic empowerment program for recapitalization of businesses of women petty traders in the state. She paid a course of visit to the state governor, Sheriff of Oriwari, at Government House, Asaba. Program, program that is very, very impactful. And we are touching our women and touching people across. And not only within the state, for the 36 states of Nigeria. 1,000 selected women across the state converged on the Dome Event Center, Asaba, to receive the 50,000 Naira Empowerment Grant of the First Lady's Renewed Hope Initiative. In her remarks, the president's wife said the grant is to assist women petty traders in overcoming some of their business challenges, expand their businesses, create more jobs, and contribute more robustly to the economy. I salute you all and celebrate your courage and resilience that keep you going to put food on the table for your families. Today, through the Renewed Hope Initiative Economic Empowerment Program, we are providing 1,000 pre-selected women petty traders per state with a grant of 50,000 Naira each to recapitalize and grow their businesses. A total of 1 billion 850 million naira will be disbursed to 37,000 women petty traders across the nation. Earlier in her welcome address, the governor's wife, who supported the first ladies program in the state with 50 million naira, urged the beneficiaries to inject the grants into their businesses and contribute to the well-being of their families. In line with this, my dear husband. Right Honorable Sheriff Ogrowori is supporting this program empowerment team with the sum of 50 million naira. Some of the beneficiaries revealed their intention about the received grants. Actually, I sell branded crayfish and, and fish as well, and uh, uh, bonga fish as well. So thank you because we help to boost my business. And with this money, I know I can buy a bong that distribute to my customers. I said them, I said at the right price amount, and I know with this money, I can make up something good. I am I'm into food items, so I'm going to use it and add up to my business, at least to get a shop, a small shop, so I can be able to let the business increase more than it is before. As Nigeria's first lady continue to work together with others to build a Nigeria where every woman has the opportunity to succeed, where every small businesses can grow and contribute to their prosperity, it's important to give them the necessary support to contribute to national development. In Asaba for News Central, Austin Azu. The federal government has issued a warning to states as water levels in the river Niger continue to rise. The Nigerian Hydrological Services Agency, NIMSA, sounded the alarm on Friday, citing upstream activities in Niger and Mali as key contributors to the rising waters. According to a statement from NISA Director General Umar Mohammed, flood waters from these neighboring countries are expected to flow into Nigeria through Kebi State. Dam operators at Kanji and Jaba on the River Niger have been alerted and are prepared to manage the situation. NIMSA has advised states and communities along the river Niger to remain vigilant as the flood waters are expected to peak towards the end of August and into September. And now into a very tragic incident in Nigeria's border town of Kirawa. Four farmers were murdered by terrorists suspected to be members of Boko Haram. New Central's Umaru Kirawa reports that the victims were engaged in agricultural activities when the terrorists launched their assault, underscoring the ongoing security threats faced by rural communities in the area. 
the councillor of Kirawa, Jimini Ward, who is also the speaker of the Guza Local Government Council, Bukar Umar Aji, confirmed the incident calling the attention of armed forces to provide adequate security to the people to farm and earn their means of livelihood. Chairman of Kirawa Development Association, Yakubu Maba Ali, who spoke to our correspondent, said the attack on farmers will further compound the challenges faced by the communities that are rebuilding after years of insurgency. Earlier, a resident of Kirawa Guza local government area of Borno State, Abdullahi uh, Belu Kirawa, spoke to us on this development. To, to, do, to work in farm and Boko Haram. Yesterday, uh, they were. They are doing activi their activities in their farm yesterday. So, the Boko Haram attacked them and killed two. The first, they killed two. So, we went to the bush and the our military men, multinational joint across, we went to the farm and picked the dead body. So, after all, we came back and later on, we are the three people they are, were missing. So, we are, we are waiting to hear the information about the two people. We are searching them. So, the Boko Haram now call us with phone to tell us that there are still dead, two dead bodies in the bush. We killed them. So, we should come and find them. We should... A very tragic incident. And now to Lagos State, where its government has announced its inaugural uh, sustainability summit. Now, the, this aim, or rather the aim, is to float a new initiative that would advance its vision to create a resilient and sustainable approach towards the realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. New Central's correspondent Bettina Unwili reports. Thursday, the Office of Sustainable Development Goals, OSDG, launched the Lagos Sustainability Summit, a yearly multidisciplinary forum designed to advance strategies and create actionable pathways to build a more equitable, inclusive, and prosperous Lagos. The summit, coming up in the second week of September, is being organized in collaboration with Lagos State Safety Commission, LSSC, and Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency, LASEPA. The Lagos Sustainability Summit stands as a testament to our collective resolve. It's a landmark event born from our collaborative efforts of key agencies, the Lagos State Office of Sustainable Goals, the Lagos State Safety Commission, and the Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency. Addressing journalists at the press conference, Special Advisor to Governor Babajide Sanwolu on Sustainable Development Goals Dr. Aurel Luafini said the summit would reiterate the state government's drive to strategically reposition Lagos towards advancing its vision of becoming a resilient and sustainable city. The work we do here today is not just for us, but for generations yet to come. It is for the children who will inherit this city, who will look to us, not just as leaders, but as guardians of their future. Let us be worthy of that trust. According to Dr. Babatunde Ajayi, the general manager of La Sepa, the initiative is not only intended to enhance sustainable business practices, but also to champion the protection of the environment for the well-being of the city's inhabitants. So on our side as the Environmental Protection Agency, consistently we have ensured that um, industries and organizations that commercial ventures Accompanied by environmental regulations, and they are also able to leave or run their businesses by environmental standards. All of these standards are to, to make sure that our environment is well protected, and we don't leave we don't leave a very bad Lagos for our children. As the city moves forward with these plans, officials are calling on all Lagosians to get involved and support these transformative projects in Lagos. For New Central, Bettina Nwili.
Lesotho is a country situated in southern Africa with a population of about 2 million people. But with the El Nino weather phenomenon wreaking havoc in many African countries, Lesotho is one of these countries that has been affected. Over 700,000 of its about 2 million citizens are facing food challenges. Earlier this year, the government declared a national state of food insecurity disaster as the most severe. Meanwhile, the country has a long historical history of uh, political instability largely related to disputes among factions of the Lusoto political parties. Its citizens face not only hunger but economic challenges too. And now joining us is uh, New Centro's Wangani Ziziba who is live in Lusoto. Well, Wangani, many thanks for joining us. Uh, can you give us an overview of, you know, just an overview of Lusoto and, and have you had the opportunity to speak to citizens and what can you tell us about the country and all that it's facing? Like my third time being in this country, it is quite a vibrant city, but not, I cannot say it's more vibrant uh, than South Africa, but definitely Lesotho is very vibrant and beautiful. A country that are uh, in between our uh, mountains and very cold when it's uh, uh, that weather time around June. But uh, citizens that I've spoken to are like in the streets, people that I've spoken to. We know that in 2022, uh, Lesotho was going uh, through elections where a government, there was change of government. Uh, and the opposition came into power. But uh, speaking to citizens, how they feel about um, the government that is there now, uh, they are saying that they are giving that government uh, time for them uh, to work on uh, the challenges that they are facing. But also you spoke about the drought. We know that uh, Lesotho is one of those countries in Sadak that is experiencing drought. Lesotho doesn't have uh, much rainfall, uh, just like uh, many other uh, Sadiq countries. So uh, citizens here are experiencing Doubt, drought rather, but not only drought, citizens also have uh, social problems that uh, they are facing. But with me, I have uh, just uh, citizens that um, are willing to speak to us. Let me just bring in uh, Tepi, so uh, she's Tepang rather, she's a social worker, just to speak to us about what social challenges are Lesotho people are um, facing. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Tepang, and thank you for joining us here at News Central. What are some of the challenges that our citizens of Lesotho are facing, the social ones? Good afternoon. Uh, there are quite a number of challenges that we are facing here. Um, the main one being poverty, uh, which also you know, tends to be an underlying factor to multiple problems that uh, citizens here are facing. But also we can note that uh, challenges vary from one group to the other. We have uh, specific challenges that we can say can clearly be attributed to poverty, yes, but at the end of the day, they reflect more amongst the youth, they reflect more amongst adult persons, older persons, persons with disability, and many other categories that we can, we can make reference to. Uh, thank you, Tsepang. Let me just bring in another citizen again, just to speak about the drought, like I indicated that uh, Lesotho people are also facing drought, just like any uh, such uh, countries. Lesotho, uh, you guys are also facing drought. It's not only in Lesotho, but we have seen it in Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia. What exactly are the citizens saying, and uh, what is the government saying? Is there any help that uh, as citizens you are getting? Thank you very much, Mayor. And um, as for the this situation, we are aware as the Soto Nation that uh, the Prime Minister or the, rather the government has declared the state of emergency in terms of the poverty that uh, is facing the country. We all know that Lesotho is relying on farming. So if the weather is not conducive for the farming, it means it affects us most because we don't have other ways of living except rearing and relying uh, solely on the on the agriculture so basuto we are facing a, a lot of challenges due to that kind of weather changes uh, that is happening maybe or around the world but we are mostly affected as basuto uh, and also in 2022 we know that uh, a new government came in as citizens, uh, how are you coping? Are you still uh, happy with the current government? Uh, any about, uh, especially the new government that came in in 2022? Yes, as Basutu, we may differ on this one, but most of Basutu, we are happy because if we can compare uh, the previous years, the previous governments before this one, 
Uh, during this time of uh, about two years, we had uh, a change in government. That means uh, previously we had uh, unstable government, but for now, at least is almost two years. Then we are believing that this government is doing a lot of things, although not um, already reaching what we want as Basoto, but we still have hope. We still uh, hope that if the government is given more time, maybe things will change for the better as compared uh, to a previous one. Uh, yes, Judith, the Basutu people advocating for more time for the government that came in in 2022, but also the social and economic challenges of many citizens. Mungani, many thanks uh, for that very insightful expose there on Lusoto. The we appreciate you for doing this with us. Well, stay in the region as South Africa's former president and current leader of the opposition, uh, that's MK Party, Jacob Zuma, announced that he is leaving the African National Congress, ANC, claiming that it is no longer the ANC he once knew. Zuma's decision follows his expulsion of, from the party last month after leading the MK Party into elections, a move that violated ANC rules. Now, during a press conference in Johannesburg on Thursday, Zuma explained his de departure, stating that the ANC has strayed from its original principles and direction. Of small, unviable political parties, it's not sustainable for the future of black people in South Africa. It's not sustainable at all. I'm leaving the ANC because it has gone out of the way. It's no longer the ANC, we know. This is the Ramaphosa ANC. And we said it. And we continue saying it. They've deviated. They've moved out of the way. One day, when I'm an old man, because now I'm very, I'm very young, I'm very young man. <laughs> I, will, I will tell people, I will tell the citizen of this country that you sold out by creating other organizations, helping the enemy to disperse us so that we don't have a concrete majority. Because that's what is done with these little parties that we've been establishing, all of us. You must have seen the clips and the videos from the from DNC convention uh, live from Chicago throughout the entire week. Well, the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has officially accepted the Democratic presidential nomination at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, pledging a new path forward for the nation. Now, in a key note address, Harris vowed to be a president who unites uh, Americans and stands firm against uh, detectors, uh, drawing a sharp contrast with her Republican opponent, Donald Trump. Now, the convention held in Chicago concluded with Harris's powerful speech signaling the Democratic Party's vision for the future. On behalf of everyone whose story could only be written in the greatest nation on earth, I accept your nomination to be President of the United States of America. Our nation, our nation with this election, has a precious, fleeting opportunity to move past the bitterness, cynicism, and divisive battles of the past, a chance to chart a new way forward. Not, not as members of any one party or faction, but as Americans. I will be a president who unites us around our highest aspirations, a president who leads and listens who is realistic, practical, 
and has common sense and always fights for the American people. And know this, I will never hesitate to take whatever action is necessary to defend our forces and our interests against Iran and Iran-backed terrorists. I will not cozy up to tyrants and dictators like Kim Jong-un, who are rooting for Trump, who are rooting for Trump. Because, you know, they know, they know he is easy to manipulate with flattery and favors. They know Trump won't hold autocrats accountable because he wants to be an autocrat himself. Now on to business. Nigeria is spearheading financial innovations that are revolutionizing the way individuals manage and access their funds. However, this rapid advancement brings with it new challenges and opportunities. Uh, now, we delve into the current trends and innovations and insights that are shaping Nigeria's digital banking landscape and their implications for the future of financial inclusion, regulation, and profitability. We have uh, Shegun uh, Femi Oyedeli, who is the founder of Rise uh, Digital Services and who was a guest on the Business Edge show and who shared his perspectives on the key trends influencing the digital payment and banking industry in Nigeria and their impact on the sector. Take a look. Mobile payments uh, in the digital bank space or in the financial space in Nigeria. Uh, look at the rise of POS terminals. Uh, in 2020, uh, there were about, I think there were about 155,000 POS terminals. By 2022, we have over 1.1 million POS terminals. That's almost uh, a thousand percent increase, and the numbers keep growing. Uh, so that's one of the major areas. There's been less cash dependency. There are digital payments. If you want to take your transport, you can pay for transportation. Uh, Boats, Uber, all of those things, you can do that within the app. You'd have to start carrying cash. So those are some of the areas that has been taking good space as far as the uh, you know, the trends. Uh, online shopping, uh, and, and all of this has been supported by the growth in other sectors, right? If you look at the fashion industry, entertainment, and all of those things, they are growing at a very Now for a piece of sport. Now, just a few days before the Paris uh, Paralympics 2024, Loretta Onye has been named Nigeria's flag bearer for the Paris 2024 Paralympics. Now, Onye, who is competing in her third Paralympics, previously won gold in the F40 short put at Rio 2016 and bronze at Tokyo 2020. Balashade Olufemiayo will be the general captain of Team Nigeria. A seasoned athlete, Olufemiayo secured gold at Tokyo 2020 and silver at London 2012. The Nigerian team is currently training in Germany ahead of the Games. After a medal-less performance in the Paris Olympics, the Paralympics are seen as a chance for Nigeria to regain national pride. The opening ceremony will take place next week with the team ready to, to showcase their talents on the global stage. Hopefully they would give us that gold that we've been looking for finally. But that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. President Tinubu swears in Kekereku as 23rd Chief Justice of Nigeria. Supporters throng Supreme Court premises ahead of final verdict in the Bayelsa and Kogi State's governorship election dispute. And lastly, former South African President Jacob Zuma exits the ANC over what he termed the party's departure from its original principles. Now remember that you can send us your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number now showing on the screen. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on social media. We're at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live or DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Judith at TV. Mm -hmm.